Hi, Richard. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I can do it. Yeah. Good. Good. Can you just open your camera? Okay. Okay. I can make it. I can see. Okay. I, I can I see your camera. Okay. Good. So, good, good morning. So, you are now in Indonesia or in, 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 uh, can, uh, in Australia? I'm actually in Indonesia at the moment. Great. Great. So, enjoy, you also, also enjoy your holiday with your family? Uh, well, uh, in our nearest neighbor. Oh, great. Great. Okay. <laughs> So let me do a very short introduction uh, uh, for you to the audience. So uh, actually, uh, Richard is the expert in doing the tacit knowledge as well. He's uh, he's uh, uh, doing this uh, tacit uh, tacit exchanges for resilience and DV. He holds the former knowledge management expert for Victorian government. He's also the former honorable, uh, honorary fellow of e-scholarship recenters in Melbourne University. Very good, um, I mean, the, the, the roles. And then also Richard also held uh, many years of doing the knowledge management. He has uh, done a lot of uh, this, uh, um, and the, 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 the the, the um, practice like uh, and helping a lot of uh, uh, the students, uh, the, the peoples, uh, the companies uh, in transmit their knowledge, experience to the young, to the young peoples. So let's welcome uh, Richard to give us the sharing about uh, his topic today is, uh, let me see. Let, let, is uh, passive knowledge, social learning, and innovation. So this will be his sharing to us. Thank you, Richard. Now, let's welcome Richard. Thank you. Well, thank you. Like all the other speakers, I want to thank um, Fisher and his team and everybody for the opportunity to talk today. It's uh, lovely to be uh, an Australian representing this global initiative. And uh, we're very grateful here in Australia to be included in any global initiative. I, I want to today uh, allow you to and the audience to allow their imagination to work a little bit. Um, and I want to uh, just give a, a presentation, to, in a sense, really to fil facilitate imagination about what a global think tank might do in relation to tacit knowledge management. Now, um, the, what's uh, my own background? Well, very briefly, in the last 10 years, I've just to give you a few examples, I've helped establish a national innovation system around communities of practice and communities of interest in the agricultural sector across each of our states and territories. I've worked with a numerical modeler on landscape scale modeling uh, to deal with the integration of uh, water dynamics and industry, whether it's the grains industry, the dairy industry and so on. So we use data sets of time stamped data sets going back every day for more than 50 years, some of them back 130 years. And the last one, the last example is that I was involved in a knowledge management initiative in the crisis management of our COVID operations uh, with the Victorian government. So uh, I only say that because that's the sort of context that I've brought into thinking about this. Now, um, Steph, uh, Silvani, um, uh, Sil Silvani from yesterday highlighted the uh, demographics issue. Well, Australia has that problem and there clearly is an intergenerational knowledge exchange crisis emerging. And I think this is an unrealised issue at political levels. And we've heard fa a fair bit about that already. So the opportunity here is to let yourself imagine whether you're going to be an a community, participate in a community of interest. In other words, you like to find out about tacit knowledge or whether you're a community of practice, whether you are able to pro provide insights into how to do tacit knowledge, whatever you want to do to imagine yourselves in this, 
The possibility is that we could um, develop on themes around cities or energy generation or life sciences or industry focused. I've had a mixture of both um, industry, third sector as in community sector, academic world and um, industry associations. So the, uh, what I want to do briefly in this um, presentation is uh, talk about a number of different assumptions that I bring to this uh, presentation, identify two challenges, and what might a global think tank do? And what might be some high level functions? Now, I am not in any way trying to preempt or pre be prescriptive about this. I simply want to inspire your own imagination about what it could do, because it is a very unique opportunity that's been presented to us. So the first assumption that I want to highlight, and some of these things are repeat of some of the speakers, but I'm saying it in my own way, is that innovation relies on knowledge to increase what I call adaptive capacity. And adaptive capacity is the ability of systems, of people, of organisms uh, to adjust to changes in the external environment. It might be about realizing opportunities. It might be responding to, to potential damage or whatever the situation is. Now, the thing about adaptive capacity and everything through my presentation around tacit knowledge management is that everything has a situational context. And so you can't talk about tacit knowledge without talking about context. Now, in Australia, adaptive capacity has become very important. We've had very serious bushfires. We've had extremely serious floods. And communities that are resilient are those that can respond as quickly as possible to the effects of those interventions, those natural phenomena. Now, um, there's a whole literature around adaptive capacity. And uh, so I'm just, I'm not going to talk about that, but just highlight that adaptive capacity can apply to ind individuals, teams, organizations, communities, science, uh, societies. Uh, so, I just wanted to highlight that as an, as an additional slide to the presentation that I sent previously. The second assumption that I want to make is that all knowledge is tacit and personal first, but that personal knowledge is also subjective. So uh, Ron Young mentioned this uh, yesterday about the unconscious, tacit being unconscious, subjective being conscious and communicable. Uh, and so on. So all knowledge is tacit and personal. This, um, the second assumption that I'd like to, um, uh, the third assumption I'd like to bring is that whilst all knowledge is tacit first, only some knowledge becomes social. And social learning is how social knowledge becomes, uh, emerges. And social learning needs to be understood as uh, learning that is not recognised as learning. The fourth assumption is that uh, tacit knowledge and social learning are the foundations for all social knowledge. Now, social knowledge is actually quite a complicated matter because uh, social knowledge can be between two people but it can also be between and within an organisation. So negotiated agreements about what is authoritative knowledge is a very important characteristic in any large complex organisation or, uh, or network. And respecting the processes of tacit knowledge in those social negotiations is one of the greatest challenges that we face. Now, I'll just now conclude with one of the challenges that I'm putting forward. And our art this morning spoke about this challenge, 
What I, so the challenge is that organisations are socio-technical systems and that tacit knowledge can be buried in this complexity. And art made precisely this point. So we have social knowledge, but we also integrate uh, organisations, create value and respond to and communicate with their customers through the technical systems and the products that they create and the data assets and the computational infrastructure that they create to communicate with their customers. And this is what I call socio-technical systems. And each type of industry sector will have a very different type of socio-technical system. And as, as it has been highlighted very eloquently by Art this morning, this the tacit knowledge can be buried in this. And um, this is an incredibly complicated and a great challenge for us all. The second challenge that I wanted to highlight, but I am not going to talk about in any way, is that life sciences, including the use of wearable technologies, uh, so often we see people wearing watches that monitor heartbeats and so on. Um, these technologies may become conscripted in to manage and or monitor, I should say, and understand tacit knowledge, that the knowledge that's embodied in our organizations. And already I have uh, found that example of a company in the United States that's uh, uh, trying to leverage this type of role. Now, in I only mention this because if we're to become a global think tank, this may become an, an important issue going forward. So now let your imagination begin to run. Um, these are just ideas. I'm interested in discussing the design of a global think tank that takes into account the complexity of socio-technical systems in different types of contexts. So uh, our socio the design of our socio-technical systems will vary according to whatever industry or whatever function uh, the global think tank might focus on. Now, importantly, I've described this as a key function of the global think tank is to create support systems uh, for, for tacit knowledge support systems for individuals and teams, for organisations. And Ron made this point, actually, Ron, in his presentation he did yesterday in the panel discussion, which was a very excellent panel discussion. He talked about the five domains of knowledge management and there's almost total overlap with what I've just written here. There's also uh, the, the uh, think tank might be interested in uh, tacit knowledge management support systems for national innovation systems and even international innovation systems. You know, we're all ch um, challenged hugely by the global ch uh, issues like energy transitions. Uh, these are high priority uh, areas and the global think tank may want to focus on some of these high priority issues. So let's just unpack that a little bit. Now, again, I'm not being prescriptive here, but here's some, the sorts of things that uh, a think tank might, how they might service individuals. Now, individuals being interested in their own personal knowledge journeys, their careers, their time in departments, uh, in organisations and their careers. And some examples of the sorts of things that um, soft skills that people need are around personal resilience and adaptability. And um, for example, even how to think about discovering what we don't know that we don't know. It's very, very important for people to suspend judgment about things that happen to them because so often we rush to judgment. So uh, equipping people to do have those sort of uh, soft skills is critical. 
Then in teams, we've had some wonderful um, uh, presentations about this. Um, and uh, the, for example, um, uh, Jonathan, I think it was, uh, talking about the Socratic nature of uh, teams and um, learning to have powerful conversations, to inquire with each other, to respect each other, to co-create, and then how teams might codify, uh, present and share information. And I just want to highlight that remember that we're not doing this just for the sake of doing tacit knowledge management. We're trying to shift the situational context and produce some sort of adaptive outcome to create resilience for teams. So that's some ideas about uh, the individual. So um, then there's organizations now this is a vast area of um, domain but the a, a global think tank might explicitly bring in how to manage tacit knowledge for organizations and to give you an idea of what i mean by this is i, re I referred to the processes of so negotiating social agreements now, developing an authorised policy within a department or within a, a company or a, a, a process does require social negotiation and then it also requires some approval. And that approval might be documented in a procedure which then uh, becomes part of the organisational knowledge um, profile, if you like. Uh, now, we all have experienced the roles of review, and so often it is um, very challenging to take the tacit knowledge dimension into those and to respect those, uh, those dimensions in any social negotiation around the control of an organisation. So uh, that is a, a very big area of uh, possibility for the um, and, and I, might, I might add here that there's an enormous opportunity to build the leadership profiles to help leaders be able to suspend their own judgment about stuff and let teams and organisations create their knowledge in ways that is beneficial. And of course, here I've, it's a very busy slide, but here I highlight that a a, a global think tank might build scaffolds for action that might be relevant for nation states and international innovation systems in helping solve challenges that nation states would agree to collaborate on. And so a global think tank could focus on the tacit knowledge support systems around advocacy, policy, training, and it might even initiate some research. And the presentation that was given by Oliver Schwab um, was in a sense a scaffold for the value networks that work in uh, these types of innovation systems. So he and I think a, a woman by the name of Verna Ali are quite leading thinkers in the value networks, which I think uh, uh, contribute to these in innovation systems. And I've also put some ideas in there in that busy slide. Um, uh, I listened to the presentation by Professor Leif Edvinson, and I was highly excited by some of the things that he was saying around advocacy. Now, I, you might notice on the right-hand side all the way through this, I've referenced the United Nations Sustainability Goals. Now, it may well be that a global uh, think tank might have um, its line of sight to these sustainability development goals. Uh, I leave that open to everybody else, but I'm highly charged by the responsibility of a, <laughs> I'm now ent exiting the workforce, uh, but I clearly have passions. 
for our next generation. And these sustainability goals are very noble goals. Now, a couple more slides um, before I end. I just wanted to highlight the uh, in these scaffolds for action, there may well be roles for specialist tacit knowledge mentoring. And in my experience, I'm just using my experience here, is that some of the attributes of a, a knowledge, a tacit knowledge mentor um, are listed as follows. Firstly, uh, there's the principle of impartiality, of not coming in representing any particular um, perspective or interest. Um, they would need to be capable in leading effective and constructive conversations. And we've heard a lot of uh, presentations about the enormous capabilities in our community of practice in that type of area. There's the ability to assess the situational context rapidly. And uh, I think this is a, a very significant skill because you're not just, this needs interdisciplinary thinking. It's not just business management skills, although they're critical. And I myself have a training in business administration, but it's also understanding who stakeholders are, who, you're, who you need to work with to develop some sort of impact and what are the constraints that you would realise in moving towards some sort of adaption. The next uh, area is the sensitivity to professional domains and their languages. I started out as a forester um, and I was interested in land management and the revegetation of a large chunks of um, our country in Australia. But I ended up interacting with engineers, social scientists, linguists, philosophers, uh, and so on. So a tacit knowledge mentor has to be highly interdisciplinary. Well, I think it's beneficial if they are highly interdisciplinary and uh, sensitive to the domains of languages and to the respectful of those domains. And uh, then there's the uh, sensitivity uh, to personal life transitions I've and well-being. I've noticed that uh, in any move towards adaptive capacity outcomes, often people's own personal lives can become a constraint. Now, it's not that we intervene into their own in individual psychological journeys, uh, but we need to be extremely sensitive to those types of uh, issues and where appropriate, maybe there's some very respectful um, inquiries into that. And then the other thing that I'd highlight and um, is the, and this is a very challenging area, is understanding the components of the socio-technical systems that give rise to adaptive capacity. And I found this one of the most difficult areas um, in my uh, professional life. The reason is because so many of the knowledge platforms that emerge are often chosen and implemented for a whole lot of um, pragmatic reasons. And I'm, I don't think it's appropriate for me to go into it, but you know, the vendors that provide big platforms to organizations are not often interested at all in tacit knowledge and the creation of knowledge artifacts, as well as the life cycle of those artifacts through to their archival, long-term archival persistence. If you can imagine you're ma managing, uh, doing modeling of a landscape and you're, you need data sets going back 50 to 100 years, you need very, very um, high level um, uh, skills in designing the informatics 
to ensure that you can access to those data sets going back a long period of time. And finally, uh, the other attributes is a personal commitments, if you like, to the varying dimensions of adaptive capacity. So I want to conclude here by saying, it, these are just some ideas about what a, a global think tank might do. I would encourage it to be involved with support systems for individuals and teams for organisations, and potentially if, um, if it doesn't get become too difficult and too onerous, but national and, in and international innovation systems. Uh, I mentioned the word support systems because I think one, one of the things that um, complicated learnings I've uh, achieved in or arrived at in my career is that we need to equip the employees of the organisations to do the hard work. We do not, as knowledge manager, as tacit knowledge management professionals, enter into doing the work ourselves. Uh, we are there about strengthening individuals to take charge of their lives, their teams, and to create enjoyment out of it. I would conclude by saying that um, <clears throat> years ago, I ran an international uh, cross-cultural education centre. Uh, so you can see I've had a, a fairly diverse <laughs> career. And one of the things I never, can, I never quite know where I learned this from, but there was a phrase in that that I learned there in, is that in, in other cultures, we find the hidden parts of ourselves. And in running a global think tank, that's in a sense born global out of China, to me offers huge opportunities for us all to find the hidden parts of ourselves. I thank you so much and I wish everybody well and you can stop imagining now and actually imagine your lunch. So please go and enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for your sharing, for your wonderful sharing. Actually, your uh, I mean, session.